What's up, Wildside besties and baddies? I'm Bailey. And I'm Chelsea. And we're here to walk you through the wild sides. From homicides to hostides and everything in between. We're so glad you're here. So buckle up and enjoy the ride. What's up, Wildside? Welcome back to part D. Okay. So to do a super quick recap yes. we have the we have the birth of black metal norwegian black metal mm-hmm. that began in the mid to late 80s yes and within this we have the main group which is mayhem they adopt death as their lead singer dead dead excuse me they adopt dead as their lead singer Dead ends up committing suicide, leaving a suicide note. The other originator of this band, Euronymous, Euronymous, Euronymous really just shows some true colors, exploits Dead via posting his picture on an album, all of this, but then starts getting into more political, like, you know, we need to really make sure that the posers are staying out and we need to stay true to black metal. He kind of starts a whole nother sub category, um, which attracts new members into the band mayhem, but also kind of breaks off into attracts some of the, the beginnings of new black metal that are like mm-hmm. true black metal bands yeah not for the posers not for the posers we'll hard towards satanists and definitely not for mamas to listen to definitely not for mamas and then they view this the the source of all things vile and anti-norwegian and anti-death metal as christianity and that's yes mostly Euronymous for sure but there's also reports that Euronymous really wasn't really into that stuff it was again just the image that Mm -hmm. he wanted to present to be he was like a verbal exhibitionist right Right. like he wanted to say things and do things to shock people but Varg was absolutely into like Christianity is the root of all modern problems and now we are starting to get into the bad blood that is Varg versus Euronymous. Euronymous. Yep. Okay. And now we have a musical rivalry within the black metal genre. Yeah. Okay. Maybe not a musical rivalry, but a like a mission, like a vision rivalry between what it okay. should. You know what I mean? Yeah. Vision rivalry. Okay. Mm-hmm. June 6, 1992, Fantoft Stav Church, a 12th century historic site, is burned to the ground, sparking a wave of arsons. No, that breaks my heart. Yes. I, I'm sorry. I don't really care if it has Christian origins or not, but I am a lover of historical buildings i'm with you i literally said the same thing to zach i was just like i don't care what religion or what culture it's from if it is from the 12th century shame on you you arrogant little person yeah barg who was the leader of the one-man band band burzum he was strongly suspected of the involvement though not convicted for this specific fire because they didn't really have the evidence, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The church burnings began in the early 1992 and continued for several years. Not months or weeks, years. Mm -hmm. Just months after the Fantoft fire, Ossane Church was burned to the ground. No. In late 1992... Storitvite Church burned to the ground, adding to the growing wave of church arsons that rocked Norwegian society. Skjold Church 
again, 1992, was another church that was destroyed during that same year. Cementing 1992 as the year when the black metal scene's church burning campaign gained widespread notoriety. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, murder would add to that. Do you remember the kid that I brought up earlier, Faust, who was the kid who worked in the record shop and mm-hmm. then became the drummer for that band? Yeah. Or Emperor? Yeah. Well, this next piece of the snowball belongs to him. And so this is why this case was so hard to put together is because Mm -hmm. there are like eight themes in this case. There are church burnings and suicides and murders, multiple murders, different time periods, different bands. And it it was so hard to try to put like a million pieces of data into like a one coherent paper. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. It doesn't matter where you like how you make this flow. It it's still a little jagged, right? Sure. Because it just is the nature of it. Yeah. So Faust, this kid who worked in the band, on August twenty first, nineteen ninety two. So this is right in the middle of church burnings, and it's important because all of this um, exacerbates everything, right? Mm-hmm. It gets bigger mm-hmm. and bigger, kind of like a fire, right? Mm-hmm. Not to have a bad pun here, but. Mm-hmm. While he was visiting his fam his family in Lillehammer, Faust ended up killing a man. Supposedly, Faust was walking home from a pub one night and was approached by a gay man by the name of Magni Magna Andreasen. And Andreasen reportedly sexually propositioned Faust. Mm-hmm. Now, as a side note here. There's a lot that I came across in research that black metal is not a super open-minded group, as you can probably imagine. Oh, wow. So not only do they hate Christians, at least in this wave, I'm sure it's evolved in other areas since right. then. But at this time, there was a lot of reports that I came across about like homophobic themes and racial discrimination, right? right. Like, there was a lot there. So this is no surprise with this incident. And according to Faust, and- Andreasen agreed to go with him. So Faust was like, yeah, let's go to buy the nearby woods. And Faust ended up stabbing him 37 times mm-hmm. and killing him. Mm-hmm. When he returned to Oslo the following day, he told Euronymous, Varg, and a few other members of the the Black Circle what he had done. And so... With this confession, I guess what they all decided to do a few days later, Euronymous, Faust, and Varg decided more had to be done in their, what, in their mission. And that's when they all set fire to Holman Cullen Chapel together. And this chapel was in the capital city of Oslo, and it was a church that burned down and it became really high profile because it was in the capital right of norway so this is where significant media attention starts to play into this this whole thing Mm -hmm. in total chelsea more than 50 churches were damaged or destroyed in arson attacks during this period as well as numerous churches being vandalized so there are a lot of churches that had their windows broken spray paintings of satanic symbols like upside down crosses 666 and the ever so popular pentagram and so these church burnings just added to the reputation of the black metal scene of being hardcore satanists yeah are you so mad right now yeah I I don't know. I don't, I just don't, for, you know, people have weird things. And one of my weird things is I really hate like physical destruction because I, I find it meaningless. Like, I don't know. I just really hate vandalism, arson, because I, I just, it's one of those things that it affects so many people. And it's, yeah. it, I don't know. It's all, I also view it as a, like a very coward way to go about things there was so my father-in-law was telling me about this months ago and i don't remember all the details but there was this guy in california who supposedly found the oldest tree in like existence yeah and 
they were like, well, this, it's supposed to be, it's like 7 million years versus, I don't even know. Right, right. But to prove it, he cut it down and took the sample to get it authenticated. So, you know, that happened in Austin. Do you remember that happening in Austin? They like, they poisoned the oldest living live oak. And it was, you know, they had deemed it however many old, how many, however many years old. And a couple of just punk teenagers from what I remember, and and I could be wrong on this, but yeah, went and poisoned this tree. Yeah. And I'm just like, and not to be like a, you know, like hippie tree hugging person, but my thing on the cowardice, the cowardness, cowardice, cowardness of it is again, I'm like, pick on, pick on somebody your own side, like. Pick on something that can fight back or defend itself. And to me, right. like buildings and trees and things like that, I mean, you're just picking. Like, yeah, it really bothers target. me. I don't know why that bothers me. Like, it just really does. Yeah. It's yeah, like people it who don't return their shopping carts. That's another thing. I'm like, just be a decent human being and return. You know, in Germany, they you have to put a euro in the shopping cart. Yeah. Get it. So you can't get a shopping cart unless you get a euro. And it, the only way to get your euro back is to return your shopping cart. Yeah, that's what they do here at the U.S. Aldi's. They do the same program. And I think that is a brilliant a book because yeah. they don't have any sharpened carts, shopping carts rolling around in the Aldi parking lot. No, ma'am, they don't. And so by January of 1993, Varg, homeboy Varg, continues his mission and bird, burns down the Skjold Church, which was a historic wooden church. Again, as part of his anti-Christian campaign, Mm -hmm. he was an outspoken advocate for the burnings, seeing them as a way to rid Norway of Christianity and remove the revival and to renew the revival of paganism. Oh, wow. But this was also where he started to become more at odds with Euronymous. Okay. Mm -hmm. Euronymous, again, the generally accepted leader within the black metal scene, encouraged the extreme behavior within his record shop. So he would like talk about it with these other, you know, black metal metal metalheads. And he'd continue to promote this ideology of like true Norwegian black metal and all of this nihilistic stuff that went along with it. Mm -hmm. He encouraged the violence and destruction combined with his close association with figures like Varg. This solidified the continued arsons, Mm -hmm. right? So like, it's just a bad thing with a bad thing with a bad thing, and it just it just builds and builds and yeah, builds. It's compounding. At some point throughout this church burning chaos, Euronymous decided to try to pr- promote his record label in order to attract more customers. So he decided on a media interview, and he thought that was the best way to promote. However, he didn't want to draw attention to his face, apparently, so he asked Varg to do it. Varg agreed, but perhaps not really wanting to help Euronymous. He had his own agenda. So with this opportunity of the interview, he tried to shake things up and force a change to the mentality of black metal heads, right? Mm-hmm. So he arranged for an anonymous interview where he spoke about the arson of the Christian churches and mentioned the murder of a homosexual man by Faust of Emperor. The journalist, having his own agenda wanted to expose the presence of the organized Satanists in Norway. And so the interview provided him with the information he needed. So he was able to manipulate and incriminate Varg. And supposedly in this interview, this journalist manipulated to where he said he was going to like intended to kill his parents and involved with an arson or something like that. And so following the interview, the journalist contacted the police and they got enough information from this anonymous interview and Varg was arrested. Nice. Right? But unfortunately, the interview got published and as a result, Euronymous, I say unfortunately, fortunately slash unfortunately, right. the interview got published and as a result, Euronymous and Helvetti attracted too much bad publicity and Euronymous couldn't handle it. Therefore, he decided he had to close the shop. His parents were riding his ass. They are like, you're getting too much public fire. Varg was subsequently released from prison sometime later. And he was mad as a two-headed snake at this point. While he was in jail, he couldn't defend himself or correct the media representations of the now satanic cults burning churches. Because you know how media 
gets a whiff of anything satanic and they're like, oh boy, we're going to ride this into town. Oh, yeah. And so things again started to shift. Right around the same time, Caring Magazine, which was a British, it's a British music um, like webzine and quarterly magazine that covers like rock, punk, and heavy metal. Mm -hmm. In March of 1993, they released their issue number 436 with a title reading, Arson, Death, Satanic Ritual, The Ugly Truth About Black Metal. Mm -hmm. And arguably from a lot of like the research that I did, this publication launched black metal into kind of not only black metal, but mayhem into like mainstream uh, thought. Like people mm -hmm. didn't know about this stuff until now they're like, you've got these Satanist, you know, black metal heads that are burning, you know, historical church landmarks to the ground. Like yeah. this is crazy, right? Yeah. And now on top of the whole burning churches, other black metal fans started burning churches and making it satanic to go along with the media's sales pitch to the public. So now it's literally a pissing contest, right? And and the the churches are the ones getting burnt. And so now this really began to piss off Barg because he believed that now this is all about Satanism and satanic cult worshiping kids when his goal was like Odinism and, you know, paganism and like paying tribute to Norwegian history yeah reclaiming the true norwegian roots that had been right you know. and for him it was never about satan and he wasn't a satanist it was never about satanism like that was never a thing okay but that's what the media was turning it into and he didn't have any say over that because he was in jail when all of this was exploding yeah. right yeah and so here over here we've got euronymous who's this messiah of black metal who's kind of Barking this stuff and these kids are burning churches, playing into this Satanism, and it's just a shit show. It's mm -hmm. becoming a total shit show. And this started a lot of tension between Euronymous and Varg, naturally, right? Mm -hmm. Some even speculate that Varg was jealous of Euronymous's hold over the black metal scene and wasn't doing anything to change it. So yeah, he's encouraging these people to do this stuff, but he's not really doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. So now Varg starts to believe that Euronymous is the problem. Euronymous is now noticing how Varg is trying to rally the troops around him into discrediting Euronymous. Mm. So now Euronymous thinks Varg is the problem. So oh, now yeah. we've got this thing going, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And in early you got 1993, bad blood. we got bad blood. And so tensions escalate between Euronymous and Varg, leading to the infamous events of August 10th. So this was a breaking point for Euronymous. It was at this time when he decided that Varg should be removed for good. From the, like, just from the culture, from the... He needs to be taken care of. Oh. Oh. Right? He started to make a plan on how he would achieve that. Like sleeping with the fishes? Sleeping with the fishes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Or the, the moose. It's Norway. Okay. So. Well, I think fish is a big part of their culture as well. That's true. That's true. Euronymous decided one day, and he ended up calling Mayhem's second guitarist Blackthorn, Snore Blackthorn Roosh, I don't know, to let him in on his plans. They're buddies. They've been in the band together. Unbeknownst to Euronymous, Varg was actually with Blackthorn in his house and heard everything on this phone call. Even the part about Euronymous wanting to kill Varg. Oh. Oh, that's problematic. And his plan of first hitting Varg with an electric shock pistol, like the kind of like the same type that security guards have. Mm -hmm. Kind of like a taser. Then, yep. Then taking him to the woods, tying him to a tree, torturing him and killing him. But in the meantime, no surprise to anybody here, making a snuff film of this. Oh, well, of course. And then taking after, like, post-mortem photos and making a second album cover right. so that he can make more money off of it. Yeah. The The pretext that he would use to get near Varg, because they were at odds, so they weren't, like, hanging out and they weren't chummy, is he, because he had his record label, he was going to arrange a meeting 
for Varg to attend to sign up Barzum to his record company. So that was the ruse he was going to use. Mm -hmm. And according to Varg, he claims that he heard Euronymous was planning to kidnap him, take him to the forest, tie him up, make a stuff film, right? He was planning to do all of this. And according to Varg, he took Euronymous very seriously, despite literally every other sentence out of this man's mouth is he was all bark and no bite. But right. whatever, right? Took right. it very seriously. The night of August 10th, Euronymous calls up Varg and says, hey, I need you to come to Oslo at some point to sign this contract for this record label. And Varg again believed that this meeting was a ploy for Euronymous to lure him, torture him, kill him. Oh. And so Varg was like, yeah, sure. But then was like, we're not going to wait, right? We're not going to wait for Euronymous to have time to set this up. So Varg and Blackthorn drive 518 kilometers from Bergen to Euronymous's apartment in Oslo. Okay. So 518 kilometers, it's like 320 miles. Yeah, so that's a long So this time. is like the whole country that they're driving across yeah, just about, right? that's a long right? drive. That's like a eighth of Texas. Yeah, it's like a five-hour drive for sure. So they hop in their European spec car. They drive to Oslo. Their Peugeot. When Bar gets there, huh? They hop in their Peugeot. In their Peugeot, yeah, probably. And when they get there to Euronymous's apartment, Euronymous lets them in. Varg starts being aggressive towards Euronymous, hitting him in the chest. Euronymous gets up and heads to the kitchen to grab a knife. Oh. Varg stops him and pulls his own knife on him. And Euronymous then tries to head to the bathroom, excuse me, the bedroom, to get a shotgun, the same one that that dad used to commit suicide. And Varg stopped him. And as a side note, these things didn't even exist. So Varg's like, oh, he was going to get all these weapons from his room. There were no weapons in his bedroom. Oh. And so a lot of people believe that he was really just trying to escape, but Varg wasn't letting him. Hmm. So Varg stopped him, and instead of going to the bedroom, Euronymous ended up leaving the building, running down the stairs, and Varg follows. Again, according to Varg, Euronymous went to attack him again, and Varg, quote, finished him off so that he died immediately. And Varg ended up stabbing Euronymous 23 times, five times in the neck, 16 times in the back, and twice in the head. The final stab to Euronymous's head was so hard that Varg could not pull the could not pull his knife and ended up leaving it in his skull. Oh my goodness. So he just killed the godfather of black metal music who apparently was trying to run away from him. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of speculation around what exactly transpired mm -hmm. because Varg also said that um, what's his buddy's name? Blackthorn. Mm -hmm. He stayed in the apartment like he didn't come down. So he wasn't actually a witness to the murder. So nobody really knows what happened except what Varg says. And Varg's a pretty extreme dude. Mm -hmm. Right. And so naturally... After he brutally murdered Euronymous, who was the leading figure of this second wave of black metal music, the gruesome murder sent shockwaves through the black metal community. And sadly and tragically and ironically, of course, cementing its dark legacy, right? Like it just keeps adding to the like mysticism around this, this genre of music, right? Do you get what I'm saying? This is... Yes, and this is out of control. Like this is yes. this is out of control. Somebody needs to put some red tape. Like these are your boundary lines, friends. <laughs> y'all need y'all need to chill out. Huh? We know you're hardcore, blah blah blah, but y'all need to y'all need to really wind it down. Pump your brakes. We mm hear -hmm. Like this is where. If I were teaching fifth grade for the day, I would say, I need you to sit on your pockets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I need you to sit on your pockets. 
Okay. And what's crazy is initially the media, so when they found out that, you know, Euronymous, who's this, you know, Satanist leader of this cult underground black metal music, right, was murdered because his body was, he was left in this alleyway. He was left outside. And when he was discovered, of course, the news picks it up and it's right in the middle of all these church burnings or right after, kind of on the heels of these church burnings. Right. And so these theories soon emerge, suggesting that the killing stemmed from a power struggle within the black metal scene or like a financial dispute over unpaid royalties for Burzum's music, maybe the desire to escalate the violence following the infamous Lillehammer stabbing incident. So like some of the other rumors were these guys are always trying to one-up each other because their egos are not in check. And so they're like, hey... You know, Faust killed this dude in Lillehammer, so, like, we need to one-up that. So there's all of this just blowing around like crazy. And less than a week later, Varg um, Vikernes was arrested in Bergen for Euronymous's murder. Yes. So it took them, like, nine days, and they ended up finding Varg. Now, there, um, there's a lot of... There's a lot of data here about, like, how he got caught. There was, like, other people involved with his trying to set up his alibi, like, secret recordings, phone taps. There's a whole lot that goes into it. Regardless of all of that, a week later, he was arrested, and he was charged with Euronymous's murder. Many of the other members of the scene, including Blackthorn and Faust, were also taken into questioning. And so Varg's trial began on May 2nd of 1994. At the trial, it was claimed that Varg, Blackthorn, and another friend had planned the murder. The third person stayed at the apartment in Bergen as an alibi, and then to make it look like they never left Bergen, he went, that he rented films, played them in the apartment, and withdrew money from Varg's account to show, like, he was there Mm -hmm. at the time of Euronymous's murder, right? Mm -hmm. So it was this whole orchestrated thing. Mm -hmm. Luckily... You know, despite all of these testimonies, luckily the Norwegian judges were like, nur. And two, le- two weeks later, on May 16th, 1994, Varg was convicted and he was sentenced to 21 years in prison, which is Norway's maximum penalty. Well, because like you said, Norway doesn't usually deal with this stuff, right? Yeah. 21 years is their penalty, max. Yeah. Max, he's 21 years. So he got 21 years for the murder of Euronymous in the arson of the three churches, along with an attempted arson of a fourth church, and for theft and storage of like 150 kilograms of explosives. Oh, dang. So he was, he had a whole lot going on. Unhinged. That dude was unhinged. Yes. He still is unhinged. Is he, is he out? I'm, well, we're going to get there. I was going to say, I'm trying to do this quick math, and I am getting dangerously close to the end of that number line. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to get there. Mm-hmm. So his buddy Blackthorn, who was there but not witness to the actual murder, he mm-hmm. was sentenced to eight years in prison for being an accomplice. Mm-hmm. The day that Varg was sentenced, two churches were burnt down, presumably as a statement of symbolic support for varg yeah yeah isn't this like the most cult leader shit ever yes it's like that south park episode where it's like dum 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 like the whole time they're singing they're just saying the word dumb yeah this is dumb dumb but there was so like yes there were some churches that were burned down some think that it's symbolic support for Varg, but there was a part of the Norwegian kind of scene that considered him a traitor for murdering Euronymous because he was like the gatekeeper, oh, the godfather yeah. of the black metal right. you know, music. Um, and for him turning his back on Satanism, even though he never really claimed to be a Satanist and only used it to provoke. Right? I really, I don't know. It's It's really interesting how like the ethics and the morals within people who are like Satanists. Do you know what I mean? Where it's like, you, you turn like holding back on me. Like we talk about 
worshiping the devil and killing people, but you actually did it. And therefore I'm really, I'm really mad at you, mister. Right. Like it's just, it's just irony in its fullest form to me. Yeah. Some of these people were said to have seen Euronymous's death as a significant loss to the scene, which it was, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and some black meddlers have, quote, sworn to avenge Arces' death. Oh, my goodness. So yes, let's death. just keep perpetuating it. Let's yeah. per- keep perpetuating well, the violence. About. That's what they sing about. This is wild. This, this is the craziest shit ever. At Euronymous's funeral, Hellhammer, which was the drummer, and Necro Butcher, who was the, the bassist, decided to continue with the band and worked on releasing an album. Before the release, Euronymous's family asked Hellhammer to remove the bass tracks recorded by Varg, right? Like, as because he killed their son and their family member. And Hellhammer said, Quote, I thought it was appropriate that the murderer and the victim were on the same record. I put word out that I was recording the bass parts, but I never did. The album, which has Euronymous on electric guitar and Varg on bass guitar, was released in May of 1994. So it was released, but with only two members remaining, Mayhem effectively ceased to exist. Right. There's some reports that they're still going or there's, uh, it's just, it's not the original people. So it's been rotated and rotated and rotated, right? Right. A few years after the murder, a band member of Emperor said that there's no discipline to the scene anymore or around that shop, right? After Euronymous's death, a cult developed around the memory of him. And so it became this whole thing. And he was hailed as like the king or the godfather, right, of black metal. Mm. They turned him into a martyr, like how all of these things have happened. Sure. A new generation of musicians also tried to gain credibility by writing on the back of his legacy. But what's really sad is there's a lot of reports and a lot of documentaries that were made that Euronymous's friends and bandmates speak with kind of like an indifference over his death. Really? Um, is like showing kind of how little these individuals care about each other. Like even Hellhammer had said, was reported as saying, like his death did not really affect him or did not shock them. Right? Like they weren't surprised that it happens. Yeah. One of... Euronymous's friends, uh, Anders Auden, had said, it wasn't odd that he ended up getting killed. He thought he could threaten to kill people without having any consequence. And then he said, I think many people felt relief once he was gone. Yowzers. That's terrible. Writer and musician Erland Erickson agreed, saying nobody was there to boss them about. The black metal police was gone. Because, again, he was very much like the gatekeeper and what he said was like what death, uh, black metal was and yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Since Euronymous's murder in 1993, there was another shock to the black metal scene. Just when you thought we were done, Chelsea, there's more. This is like a bad Billy Mays commercial. <laughs> right? Oh, Billy Mays. Yeah. But okay. John, there's more. There's more. Uh, And again, I don't super duper know how to pronounce this last name, but an individual by the name John Nodvite, he was a Swedish musician. Uh, He was the front man of the super influential black metal band called Dissection. Okay. In 1997, so this is another black metal person, black metal band member in this (laughs) underground movement genre. Mm Mm-hmm. In 1997, he was convicted for his involvement in the murder of an Algerian man, Joseph Ben Medor, alongside a fellow misanthropic misanthropic Luciferian order member. Um, Kazun tight? What did you just say? A misanthropic Luciferian order order member okay will you say that in like southern dialect so i can understand 
It was a satanic occult order founded in Sweden in 1995 mm. and later renamed Temple of the Black Light. How original. So he killed an Algerian individual? An Algerian man. Mm -hmm. And then also this Temple of the Black Light member? Mm -hmm. Or the Algerian man was a Temple of the Black Light? No, he was another member of this occult, of this cult, mm -hmm. um, helped kill this Algerian man. Oh, so he teamed up. He teamed up. He teamed up. And this murder was considered a hate crime. Go figure. Because remember we talked about there was a lot of themes of not being open-minded or accepting within this black metal community. Okay. And he was eventually convicted of this murder and he was sentenced to prison and he served seven years. Oh. Why only seven? That seems like a short I don't... sentence. But anyway, that was a bad question. Sorry, continue. After his release from prison in 2004, John revived Dissection and they released another album, um, Rain, Rain Cows, in 2006. And even though it was very different from their earlier sound, it was still influenced by his personal occult beliefs, uh, specifically those tied to the Temple of the Black Knight. Right. So now he's making this black metal music about his temple of the black light, a cult cult kind of thing. And just two years after his release from prison, like so in August of 2006, tragedy struck again. Another tragic turn for the black metal community where he also he ended up committing suicide in his apartment surrounded by occult symbols and a copy of the satanic bible his death was seen as the culmination of his intense philosophical alignment with nihilism and occultism huh. so this is my thing as a therapist there seems to be a lot of mental health issues that are stemming from this wave mm -hmm. right from this genre Yes. People are killing people. People are committing suicide. They're they're burning down churches. I mean, it just doesn't seem like we need to shift over to positive psychology here for a second and just be like, maybe the research is true, right? That if you immerse yourself in the dark and the negative and the macabre and the depressed, that it's going to have an impact on your emotions, your belief systems, your psyche. Uh -huh. Maybe we need to practice gratitude. Maybe we need to practice a gratitude list. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? Yes. I, as simple as that sounds, right? Like I, so as I was thinking and kind of processing in these moments of like reflecting on this case, First of all, I, I just want to be selfish for just a second and clarify that whenever Bailey talks about horrific things and my response is like, hmm, it's interesting. I, I apologize, first of all, because I do believe it is horrific. I, I do not in the least want to downplay horrific things that happen. And I think sometimes we get into, you know, I'm just thinking and, and listening to it in a purely contextual, you know, informative type of stance. So mm -hmm. if I ever seem like I am like, oh, that sucks, sucks to be you, I am deeply, I, I truly am deeply graved over the stuff. But continuing on from that, that is the reoccurring theme that I've thought throughout this whole thing is like, you know, maybe, like you said, maybe let's let's just chill a little bit on it and yeah, we all just need to pump the brakes and and practice some gratitude and you know let the your the, let the sun warm your face and and stay in the moment like i don't know very simple very simple things part of me is like i do think it's dangerous to start adopting these supernatural this this longing this um chasing of very dark 
demonic forces. Mm-hmm. I I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I know that people believe all sorts of things. I just don't think it's wise to play around with that. And I, and I think more so on, like you said, because I think it has a negative effect on your mental health. You mm-hmm. know, when, when everything is around destruction and chaos and maleficence, I think it does. I mean, yeah. and I think the proof is in the pudding. What good has come from any of this behavior right. and right. this mindset? What is one redeeming thing? You know, and I think like, um, what's our friend's name? Butcher, ne- necro butcher. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think you have that moment where you're just like, this is not healthy. I got to get out. Right. So the church burnings combined with the murders and violence within the black metal community became, unfortunately, defining events in the genre's history. In Norway, specifically, the burnings shocked the public, especially given the historical and cultural significance of many of the churches that were targeted, right? Mm -hmm. These tragic and dark events have shocked the world, contributing to the image of black metal as not just a musical movement, but a cultural and ideological rebellion against Christianity, anything modern, and social conformity. Many musicians in the scene have since kind of distanced themselves from this kind of era of black metal music maybe not necessarily the music but that the 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 cult if you will the vibe of it mm-hmm. but the legacy of this norwegian black metal and the church burnings remains a focal point in discussions about like you were saying the the genre's impact and the dangers of extremism mm-hmm. Yes, it's kind of like a lesson for the history books of what happens when people get way too extreme, right? Whether it's too extreme on a Christian sense or too sure. extreme in a pagan sense or too extreme and it doesn't matter. Yes, these events have been since then been widely studied, documented in books, documentaries, articles, and this just continues to shape the narrative around black metal in general, right? <laughs> The genre has since evolved and diversified. I mean, yes, they should have. It should have, right? Right. The acts of violence and destruction committed during this period left an indelible mark on the black metal's reputation. Mm -hmm. People synonymously, when you think black metal, you think the Norwegian church burnings. You think of this, Mm -hmm. like they go hand in hand. It's within the same sentence. Mm -hmm. For some, some people think that the burnings symbolize black metal's commitment to anti-authoritarianism and extremism like we talked about but for others it really is more representative of a dark chapter a dark chapter that the genre has struggled to move beyond while the music of the black metal scene has continued to evolve the legacy unfortunately of the church burnings continues to cast a huge dark shadow over the genre kind of my final words These events, so mayhems, chaos, and the downfall, and the murders, and the suicides, and the church burnings, these events serve as a reminder of the extreme ideologies that fueled early black metal and the destructive consequences that can arise when rebellion and ideology are taken to violent extremes. Yeah. And that, my dear sister... And my dear listeners, is the tragic and wild twisty like a pretzel case of the Norwegian black metal scene. Yeah. Is that not the craziest shit you've ever heard? It really is. And, you know, I I think it's going to tie well into our month of October with um, because I do think a lot of our cases are involving extremism, right? We're going to talk about the Salem witch trials at some point. And that is, I think, a form a form of extremism. Mm-hmm. And then the electrocution of baby Lawrence. I mean, I believe that eugenics is obviously a form of extremism. And mm-hmm. I, I think the, the central theme, like you said, is I just don't think anything good comes from it. 
Yeah, I I mean, I agree with you. I mean, and it's literally anything. Extreme eating, sure. extreme exercising, extreme religious ideologies, extreme anti-religious. I mean, it doesn't yeah. matter, right? I think that's why everything, I think that's why we have that old, that super old but common saying of like everything in moderation, everything yeah. in moderation, sure, right? Because when you get too far out on the ends, it starts to tip the scale. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Sure. And tipping scales is a really scary thing that can cause, like we see in this case, like a ripple effect of tragedy and chaos and misery and just devastation. And there's mm -hmm. so many people affected. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I did not know anything about this. I love whenever I can say I was today years old when I found out about something. And this is something that I, again, will be processing and chewing on for a while. <laughs> we got to give a shout out to Zach, my husband, because surprise, surprise, he's the one who showed me this. Mm -hmm. He was like so casual in conversation. Hey, are you, you think you're ever going to co cover the Norwegian black metal church burnings? And I was like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. He was like, you have never, and he gets a little hoity, right? When it comes to like cases that he knows about that I haven't heard of. Mm -hmm. He was like, you don't know what the Norwegian black metal church burnings are. And I'm like, no, Zachary, I don't know what this is. And he was like, I can't believe you don't know what that is. Like, you're going to have to look it up. So he sends me all this stuff. And I'm reading it and I'm just like, no, no. And, and like, it just gets crazier and crazier and crazier. And I was like, I'm going to have to drop out of this whole case. Like I, there was so much and, and maybe it doesn't sound like that much as you just listen to it. Or, right. But, but, but like putting all of this stuff together was insane. It, it, and it was like talking about things that you just have no no understanding and no exposure to right yeah. like if somebody's like you have to do a full hour episode about bullet ants or like yellow anacondas i'm just gonna be like i don't yeah i don't understand what that is and and you know what i mean it's yeah. just wild. it's just crazy yeah yeah it absolutely is and like you said just such a why i mean it was such a wide variety of yeah. just destruction so I don't so, know, kudos to you guys if that was your intent. I guess you did it. I wouldn't be proud of that. But, you know, if that was your intention was to harm people and generations and ruin buildings that have been there forever. No. Shame. I think we just need to do better. And I a couple of last things before we close out. Um, the shop... And it's, I don't know how it's, it's pronounced like Helvetta, like Helvetta, but I was saying Helveti, like a backwoods moron, which is sure. okay, right? Like, I don't, I don't know. Um, it ended up closing down. It is now called, um, uh, what's it called? Like, not Nosblood, Nosblood, which is Noseblood in um, Norwegian. So that's that. And it, it shut down shortly after you know but it's still the building is still there and you can still i think you can still like go to the location and what have you it's it's been a bunch of different things for different times and varg is living apparently his best life with his wife and children in france he even had a youtube video about like watching his kids run around and play in the sunlight and working on his truck you know yeah. Hey, man, you know, I hope people change. Isn't that what we hope for in the end is that people change for the yeah. better? Yes, it I is. I think so. It is. That's what we hope for. And if you guys are hurting, right, if you're having suicidal thoughts, any of that stuff, please reach out. Somebody is there to help you through it, talk mm -hmm. with you. You are not alone, even though you feel totally alone in a room full of people, you're not alone and we're here to help you. So please don't take that step because there is somebody there to help you get on the other side of this mountain into the beautiful 
belly. That's right. And as Bailey likes to always says, you are loved. You are says, huh? <laughs> you said as Bailey likes to always says, oh, as Bailey, as Bailey likes to say, you are loved, you are valuable, and you are important. And you're worthy. And you're worthy. She yep. says a lot, and I don't listen to it, apparently, because I misquote her. <laughs> <laughs> and that, you guys, is that case. Hope you enjoyed it. Leave us some feedback on social media if you liked it. And as always, thanks for hanging out with us through this wild and dark death of a ride. That's right. And this is Pocket Full of Posies signing out. <laughs> we'll catch you on the wild side. Bye, guys. Later, gators. Hey, Wild Side Tribe. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Wild Side Podcast. Make sure to tune in on Wild Side Wednesdays. New episodes will drop each Wednesday at 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We would love to hear from you, so if you have a wild case recommendation, email us at wildsidepodcast at gmail.com. That's wildside with a C. Or share your thoughts in the comments below. As always, if you haven't heard it today, you're loved, you're worthy, and you're valuable. And we'll catch you on the, the flip, flip side. side.